Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Speak Up for Blue podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Lewin. Happy Wednesday. It is Interview Wednesday, and we got a great guest. Actually, it's it's kind of an interesting guest today, Dr. Judith Weiss. Not only is she interesting for the, the books that she's written and the work that she's done over her career as a professor at Rutgers uh, and, and her work in coastal ecology, uh, but she was the first episode. She was on the first episode of the Speak Up for Blue podcast. So not to take away from any of her other stuff that she's done because she's done so many great things. This is just, I just think it's great for the podcast because this is the first person who was ever on the podcast from our first episode back in like June 22nd, 2015. She was she was there. She was there from the beginning and she's here on episode 347. I'm really looking forward to this. We're going to talk about salt marshes today, the importance of them and what people are doing when they restore them why they need to incorporate climate change effects when they're restoring salt marshes to have effective restoration. And if you don't know about restoration, it's extremely expensive and time consuming. So you want, if you're going to do it, you want to do it right. We're also going to talk about the maintenance of it and just protecting them and how important they are. It's going to be great. Uh, and of course, all of this stuff is just the start of a conversation. So if you want to talk about salt marshes, which I would call a tight, like mangroves of the north, really, of the temperate area, uh, you can do so in the Speak Up for Blue podcast community, Facebook group, whatever you want to call it. It's a Speak Up for Blue Facebook group that we have going on that where I start the conversation here on the podcast and you continue it by interacting with me and other members of the group uh, just about anything you want uh, related to the podcast or anything related to marine science and conservation. It's a great group. It's very interactive. We've got debates going on. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really kind of a cool thing. So uh, head over to speakupforblue.com forward slash group to join the group. All you have to do is use your Facebook account, put in a request to join. I'll let you in. We're at about 184 members right now, and it's growing every day, which is amazing. When you do get in there, if I forget to tell you, if you do, when you do get in there, introduce yourself, why you love the ocean so much, and shout out your favorite documentary related to the ocean. So go to speakupforblue.com forward slash group, and you can get a part of the Speak Up For Blue Facebook group. Let's start the show. If you are sick of hearing of the doom and gloom of the ocean and not knowing what to do, you're in the right place. If you want to meet people working to protect the ocean, then you are in the right place. If you want to find out how you can get involved in protecting the ocean, then you are in the right place. This is the Speak Up For Blue podcast, and I am here to empower you to live for a better ocean. Hey everybody, welcome back to another exciting episode of the Speak Up for Blue podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Lewin, founder of speakupforblue.com, marine ecologist and self-proclaimed oceanpreneur. And today is Interview Wednesdays. We have Dr. Judith Weiss, Judith Weiss on, the, on the program. I'm really excited because as I said in the pre-intro, she, the, she was the first guest of the Speak Up for Blue podcast. She was on the first episode. Uh, we talked about her book, Marine Pollution, all about water quality, uh, climate change, all the issues that are facing the ocean uh, regarding water and the pollution and chemicals and nutrients and all that kind of stuff. But it was written for the everyday person so that everybody can really understand. It was it was really a well-written book because I went through it like crazy. I still go through it to look up uh, some things for people I've recommended to certain people and they've they've loved it as well. Uh, so it's been, um, you know, it's, it's been a great book. She wrote a book in 2009 on salt marshes, and we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about salt marshes today and why they're important and why I like to call them the mangroves of the north of the temperate region, because they are so important as a coastal habitat, but we don't really value how important they really truly are. Uh, and, and, and Judith is here to tell us all about them why they're important, and what people are doing in terms of management and the concerns that she's uh, she raises uh, are valid in terms of what do we do when we restore and manage and protect salt marshes, uh, what's behind the salt marshes, do they have areas of retracting, and some adaptation to that, uh, what people are, what towns are doing in uh, wealthier towns actually that are doing to adapt to these areas. So we're going to talk all about that here on the podcast today. Before we do, before I let you listen to the interview, uh, I want to tell you about our Patreon campaign, the sponsor of the show today. Our Patreon campaign is here to really get this started. 
It's really, a, you know, this Speak Up for Blue is a media and communications company. I call it, the, I'm, I have to register it as a business this year. Uh, it's called Speak Up for Blue Media and Communications. We are here to help make you aware of what's going on in the ocean, all the issues and the solutions and how to implement those solutions. We're here to help you live for a better ocean. That's what we're here to do by providing an online po platform for marine science and conservation. This is something that is not an easy thing to do. This is something that requires a lot of dedication. Uh, this podcast is the beginning of it. It's one of the products that I'd like to, that I want to put out, that I've put out for Speak Up for Blue Media. We have other podcasts that are in the making that we're producing uh, that are coming out soon. You've heard part of it. If you've been a longtime listener, where we had on one of the Ocean Talk Fridays, we had, uh, I let you listen to one of the episodes of Marine Conservation Happy Hour. Uh, we're going to come out with other ones down the road. Uh, there's different uh, language versions of the, this podcast coming out with some great scientists and conservationists um, that are a part of, of this field. Uh, so we're coming out with a lot of stuff. We're going to build up a YouTube channel uh, and it, it takes time. It takes dedication. It takes a team. And I want to raise money for that. And because this is a community based, like I'm doing this for these Speak Up for Blue community, for your audit, for you, the audience, for the people who are uh, the, the community out there who are really looking to protect the ocean and live for a better ocean. I'm doing this for the community, so I thought, you know what, what's better to get feedback and to get people to help contribute to this company and help give back to the ocean by making other people aware and continuing your awareness journey uh, by becoming a contributor on our Patreon campaign. Uh, so if you go to speakupforblue.com forward slash Patreon, you can do you can be a monthly contributor where you get to hear all about our business ideas, about um, our social enterprise ideas, where we're going to give back uh, to people who are trying to uh, do this type of work, uh, citizen science programs, pl uh, plastic pollution programs. Uh, we're going to do a lot of things that you know don't necessarily uh, requ require revenue. Um, but what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and fund those programs through the Patreon campaign. So if you want to be a part and you want to know more about it, you can actually just, you know, join the, the Patreon community, become a contributor from $1 a month all the way up to whatever you want. Uh, you want to be a sponsor, you have a business and you want to sponsor the podcast, bring your brand up for an ocean conservation brand, you can do so. Just uh, send me an email, andrew at speakupforblue.com, and we can figure something out either through Patreon or through other means. Uh, Patreon is really easy to sign up for. Uh, it's, it, I've been a I've been a patron of other uh, creators on Patreon, uh, and you know it's been great. It's been secure. I've been there for about a year and a half now, and it's been or I guess just a little over a year now, uh, and it's been a great community for that. So go to speakupforblue.com forward slash Patreon if you want to become a contributor. Uh, if you have any questions about it, just let me know. Andrew at speakupforblue.com. Uh, I'd be willing to answer any of your questions. But Without further ado, I want to present to you Dr. Judith Weiss. Here is her interview talking about salt marshes and, the, and why we need to consider climate change uh, consequences, especially sea level rise when we're talking about restoring and managing sea, uh, seagrass, restoring and managing salt marshes. Here we go. Hey, Judith, welcome back to the Speak Up for Blue podcast. Are you ready to talk about some ocean conservation? I'm ready to talk about edge of the ocean conservation. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Judith, I, I, this, is, this is really fun for me because you were the first episode of Speak Up for Blue, and we're now recording episode 347. So it's been a long journey, but you, you kicked it off. So you know, I have you to thank for this. This is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm honored that I was the first one. And I'm oh, yeah. Again. Oh, it was a lot of fun. Um, and and we, when last time you were on, and I'll, I'll link this to the, to the show notes, uh, but the last time you were on, we talked about uh, your book, Marine Pollution, uh, which is great. I've recommended it to a number of people. They bought it and they loved it, by the way, because it, oh, right. it was such a great book. And just to let the audience know, if you're looking, if you're just getting into ocean conservation, you want to find out a lot of the issues that we're facing and sort of some of the solutions that are proposed. This book, Marine Pollution, I'll, again, I'll, I'll link to it in the show notes, is absolutely fantastic. But we're here to talk about some other things before, before we get into a coastal habitat that, that's very important, um, especially in the, in the temperate zones uh, of the world. We're going to talk about salt marshes today. But before we do, for those who haven't listened to the first episode uh, and don't know who you are, why don't you briefly tell us who you are and what you do? 
Okay, um, I'm a professor emerita. It means I'm now retired, but still alive and active and busy. <laughs> and, Very busy. Um, <laughs> uh, my field is estuary and ecology, and I spent over 40 years at Rutgers University uh, studying estuaries near and far, but uh, a lot of work in local estuaries in northern New Jersey, uh, and the, the estuaries in northern New Jersey uh, tend to be, some of them, fairly polluted. Mm -hmm. So one of the aspects that I studied was marine pollution, um, which I made use of in, in that pollution book. Uh, but another aspect that I did a lot of work on is salt marshes, which are the wetlands adjacent to estuaries and coastal uh, waters where uh, the water movement is not so great, where plants can grow. And these salt marshes perform uh, many important functions, not only for the marine life in terms of providing food, ultimately food once they die and decay, mm -hmm. uh, and, and providing habitat while they're alive. Uh, lots of small animals, from snails to crabs to shrimp to small fishes, live among the salt marsh grasses. Mm -hmm. uh, and many of the fishes are juvenile fishes that will ultimately become commercial fishes when they get bigger. So um, it's a very important for the marine life. It's also important for birds. There's a whole lot of birds that either nest or feed or live in salt marshes. Mm -hmm. And there's some mammals and, you know, uh, one turtle, <laughs> one <laughs> turtle, and so you know, on the from the land side, it's also an important. I, I'm my work is always focused on the water side, but of course, a lot of important things in the land side. And then uh, the marshes also do a lot for people that live uh, in the general area because uh, the marshes absorb pollutants, including toxic chemicals, including some of the nitrogen that might cause harmful algal blooms or low oxygen and so forth uh, with, with the phenomenon of eutrophication. Uh, it also absorbs uh, a fair amount of carbon, carbon dioxide to reduce somewhat, hopefully, um, the climate, the global warming. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and it's a great buffer against storm surge and wind and so forth. Uh, there have been studies um, showing uh, where the marshes are gone, the effects of a hurricane are much more severe in the general area compared to places where there are intact marshes there. So they do, the marshes do a lot for us as well as for the marine life. And, and are they very similar, and I apologize if you said this, are they very similar in, in say, like what people are most familiar with, uh, say, for, for mainstream sort of coastal habitats, coral reefs, and that they, they provide sort of a, an, an energy uh, dissipating effect of wave action against the, the coastal habitat? So right. If you have, you know, really tall plants that, can, that will do that. Right, right. So I guess it depends on the makeup of, of each salt marsh. So is each, each salt marsh, say, uh, in, a, in a specific area, is it made up of different uh, species of plants or yeah, well, are they the, mostly they, the same? Well, um, the species are, are sort of arranged by proximity to the water so that okay. the lowest down, the one that's in, immersed in water most, a lot of the time, more than all the others, uh, is, is the cord grass, Spartina alterniflora. I'm giving you the names of the species on the East Coast. There are okay. different species on the West Coast and in Europe and you know, other parts of the world. But what ours are, uh, the Spartina alterniflora is the low marsh species. So this is the one that's adapted to being immersed in salt water half the time. Okay, okay. And, and as you go 
higher in the marsh, you get a whole variety of other species that can't survive immersed in salt water that long. They're adapted to take a, a little bit. And then you get the high marsh, which is adapted to salt because the roots, that, the, the roots of these plants are growing in salty sediment. But the, the high marsh is hardly ever underwater. It would take a big storm, especially high tide, uh, a lot of wind, and they can survive that. But that's not their usual life. Right. Okay. They can deal with the, the occasional um, high, high tide, wind, storm kind of thing. And there's a, a, a variety of different species in, in, the higher, in the high marsh. Okay. Let's see. Yeah. I mean, salt marshes are so, are so interesting. Now, uh, when, when you uh, weren't retired, when you were working at Rutgers on, on more of a full-time basis, uh, what was the most fascinating thing that you learned about salt marshes that really to this day, you just, uh, you're still, you're still fascinated by it? Well, I guess it was the surprise. <clears throat> One of the things that we studied in salt marshes was a, um, a particular plant that's an invasive plant, Phragmites australis, the common reed. Yeah, yeah. Most people hate, and there are a lot of people out there who who make a living killing Phragmites because a lot of marsh restoration projects involve removing the Phragmites. Right. Yeah. And for they, sure. In, in, in a, this part of the world, the marsh restoration project generally involves removing Phragmites. <laughs> it's true. Well, we found that the marine animals, the shrimp, the fish, the crabs, didn't really care if Phragmites was the, the main species on the marsh or not. Okay. Um, and, and other people have seen that... Um, a lot of birds are perfectly happy with Phragmites. Some birds prefer it, actually. So, and then we also found that Phragmites um, absorbed pollutants and dealt with them better than Spartina. Hmm. So, I mean, things like, like uh, metals, for example, where um, both the plants, the, the Spartina and the Phragmites, take up most of the metals and concentrated mostly in the roots. But the Spartina would send, it's funny, I'm gesturing, and I can't <laughs> see me, and nobody can see me, but my, my hand is moving around. Uh, I love it. Uh, the, the, the Spartina sends more, a greater amount of the metals up above ground into the stems and leaves, and actually then excretes the metals from its leaves and then when the, war, when the plant's underwater, this gets dissolved in the water and circulating through the environment again. So the, the Phragmites is actually sequestering the metals better and keeping them out of trouble. So it makes me question why, you know, is this plant, granted it's invasive, and right. granted it reduces the diversity of plants in the high marsh, no, no argument there, mm -hmm. but it's doing some good. It's doing a lot of good. Yeah. And I guess it's a, it's that question of, you know, when is an invasive species good, right? A lot of times they, they're very destructive in terms of what they do in, in habitats. But in this case, uh, they seem that they, they, could, they could be doing some good. Even they are though. doing good. Right. But they do out compete. The native they outcompete the other plant. Well. Absolutely. Yeah. So the question is, think about what you want for your marsh. And, and um, you know, if it's plant diversity you want, then you get rid of the frag. Mm -hmm. But if you're interested in other features, like storm protection, the frag grows taller. It does. And, and it's very better. stable. It's very it stable. Much better protection from sh from storms mm -hmm. because it's taller, and mm -hmm. and stems are the, the the Spartina just falls over in the wind, you know. Right. The stems are not so tough. The Phragmites stems are are really tough. They're kind of woody, you know, really tough stems. So a frag would be much better. If I had a house near the water, I would want frag in front of it rather. Of than course, yeah. Stem. 
Yeah, no, exactly. Protect your home, especially when you get things like Superstorm Sandy coming at your door and, and, and you know, exactly. you protect your there, home. There is a, a community up the Hudson River in a town called Piermont where there is a, a, a community group of people who um, are convinced that the Phragmites in front of their houses protected them from Superstorm Sandy. And right. they are objecting vehemently to proposals to remove it. Of course, of course, especially when you're in a time where after that, you know, that storm and, and the damage that it did and the damage you know that it caused uh, to come back and be like, oh, no, let's remove it when it could have saved, when it probably saved their homes. Uh, I can see a lot of people having having problems with it. it. It's a pretty I would imagine it'd be a pretty controversial issue. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm telling you my side. And yeah, the side, side of those people. But yes, there is another side and it's controversial. But, you know, you asked what was my most surprising thing. And that is surprising. It, it's interesting because, you know, I work my day job. I work uh, with the federal government at uh, Fisheries and Oceans. And, you know, we're dealing in the Great Lakes. We're dealing with Phragmites as a big invasive species over the oh, yeah. bat tails. And, uh, I mean, it's just it's insane how, how much they take over. Um, but I've never actually thought about it from that, that point of view to a, a water pollution uh, reduction or sequestering. I mean, that is uh, something that I've never, I, I probably never would have considered had I not known. I think that's, uh, that's a really interesting thought process. And, it, and it, it does make you ask the question, is it worth, you know, what, what's, what are you trying to protect? And w- what is your goal? And what do you want your marsh to look like? Um, yeah. And, yeah. and, and another thing is the Phragmites, uh, with sea level rise, the Phragmites helps the marsh elevate better because mm-hmm. it traps sediments better and it's litter when the plants die and fall on the marsh surface. Its litter is bulkier, you know, and it's got this woody stems and all. Right. So Phragmites really causes marshes to elevate faster. Yeah. Spartina. Now, this has always been viewed as a negative because if your marsh is going up too high, it's not going to be a marsh anymore. Right. But in the face of sea level rise, yeah, you, know, you, you think about it another again, right? Well, this is something. I mean, this is something that we wanted to talk about. We discussed it before the interview. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of coastal habitats. I mean, around the world have been have been destroyed for development. Uh, erosion and, and other different reasons. And we've lost a lot of coastal habitats um, for, for mismanagement purposes, development, and so forth. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and even like in, in Ontario here, you know, we're having uh, lake levels that we've never seen before. These are like 100-year lake levels. And a lot of places, coastal areas, residences and businesses are being flooded out. And, you know, people are asking, why, you know, why are we getting flooded? Why is there such, was such terrible flooding in, in Lake Ontario and whatnot? And we respond, because you're building in a floodplain. You're building in a plain where, where that was historically a wetland or some sort of coastal area that would, uh, that would sort of in, impede flooding from happening further up. And we've destroyed all those habitats and we've put houses and we put residences and we put businesses along that lakefront because people wanted a lake view. They wanted, wanted a water view, right? View, right? But yeah, to, well, that's like the, the consequence. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so, you know, we've seen that happen. Um, and now we're seeing a lot of flooding happen, occurring. And we want to talk about, you know, people are going back to, to restoring sort of a, um, to, a, I, I guess, like a naturalized state where it's a living shore, uh, shoreline. Um, and, and so that means bringing back wetlands, bringing back salt marshes and so forth and, res- and restoration. And you brought up a, a great point. I'd like you to, to sort of introduce it to, to the audience right now of what is the major concern right now? Restoration is in a very expensive practice. Uh, it's very difficult to do. Uh, and it's very difficult to get approval and, and everything. But what are people forgetting about? Now? What, what's happening to a lot of the restored areas? Well, I don't know. I make people until fairly recently forgot about sea level rise when right. they're restoring uh, salt marshes. So that uh, restoring the marsh, so it's you know 
There's the, for example, uh, in, in New York City, there's Marsh Islands in Jamaica Bay. And the Marsh Islands have been shrinking as they are a combination of the, the land on the Marsh Islands sinking plus sea level rise. And the Army Corps of Engineers has had been doing um, mammoth restoration jobs by dredging sand out when it's a sort of a, what they call beneficial reuse of dredge material when they deepen channels. And so what they take the sand that they get and they have been adding it to the uh, marsh islands to increase their size. And they uh, restored the islands back to the size that they were in 1974. Right. Um, now, 1974, between 1974 and today, there was a large amount of sea level rise and um, sinking of the island. So the island shrunk a great deal and they restored it back to 1974 levels. So presumably in another 40 years, we'll be back to where we are now. Right. Or yeah. it may be less because the rate of sea level rise is increasing. So it right. may not take as long as 40 years. So, I mean, they have constraint, financial constraints. Obviously, they can't get an infinite amount of sand and, and build these things up. And, and unfortunately, what they had done was only put low marsh plants when they replanted the, uh, the marsh islands. They just put low marsh plants. Mm -hmm. I, I think now they're thinking about it, and I hope they will be doing more in terms of making it a little steeper and getting high marsh in there too. So there is a, a place for the low marsh plants to go mm -hmm. when, you know, it's, it's very hard dealing with islands, you know, really. well, for sure, for sure. And yeah. it's, it's also, you know, dealing with, I mean, the amount of work that goes into restoring an island, um, especially in today's sort of world, you've got all, all the ex experts, the engineers, the, the planners. The, 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 it's a hugely it's expensive. A huge, yeah. I mean, even to, even to get, like I was surprised, I was involved in, in a restoration project, uh, a planning project in, in the Detroit River uh, recently. And just to get the amount, like the, to get the fill, the infill into, like to the, to the site. So you had to, it was a barge was that much more expensive than it would be if it was, if it was on shore. Uh, but the amount of increase was just astronomical. Yeah. You know, and you just, you just can't believe it. So when you see a restoration project, even like a small Island, you're just like, that was probably, you know, over a hundred thousand dollars, you know, and, and, and upwards, just oh, to, upwards. To put that in. Right. And, and it's just, and it's, and you, but you hope that it's done properly because you don't want to have to do it again, or you don't want that project to fail because one, it's a lot of money right. and effort. And two, it'll be difficult to get another one done because the last one failed, right? Because people remember that when people right. are trying to fund, fund a project like that. Um, so with that constraint, it's, it's difficult. You just said it's difficult to get that amount of sand or that amount of, of infill to, to build it higher, how yeah, do we overcome I'm, that challenge? I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying, you know, I guess I'm worried, okay, right, right. Uh, about the future of, of salt marshes because um, not all salt marshes can be rehabilitated, restored, blah, blah, blah. Right. There's lots of marshes that are... Um, not going to be dealt with that are going to have to deal with sea level rise and, um, and to deal with sea level rise a, a marsh has has two choices one is to increase its elevation and to increase its elevation uh, it needs um, sediment new sediment and right. that's fine for a marsh that's uh, close to a river right the river is going to bring sediments to those marshes. And so they're fine. They're probably going to be okay, depending on the amount of new sediment they get relative to the rate of sea level rise. Mm -hmm. But they have a fighting chance. But there's a whole lot of marshes 
that don't get an inflow of sediments because they're not adjacent to uh, a river. And um, their option, if there's not, an, uh, not sediments coming in, the, uh, the, the thing they can do is to move back, retreat, right. you know, go landward. Right. If, ever, if the land behind the marsh, the marsh. Island of the marsh, is open space, you know, mm -hmm. there's place for them to go. Right. But in, in the Northeast, so often in New Jersey, in particular, that I know very well, immediately landward of the marsh, there's roads and, and there's houses and there's pavement. You know, <laughs> there's nowhere to go. And uh, so the marsh yes, will disappear essentially will ultimately disappear after they, they use the term coastal squeeze right. to describe um, the, what's going to happen with those marshes. And, and with it, like with the, like with the disappearance of those marshes, the eventual disappearance of those marshes uh, that are under those, that coastal squeeze, you would imagine all eventually the, 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 whatever is behind them, whether it be roads or residences will eventually be flooded. Of course. Yeah. It'd be, be flooded. So unless um, they're building, you know, high walls and berms and, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. Which I can see them going to in, 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 in dire straits to protect those residences. Um, but even then, eventually i mean obviously the residences aren't going to be happy about that no. uh, either way right it, it becomes a it, it let's just say it becomes a headache for everybody uh in yes. that respect now uh you mentioned before salt marshes being close to rivers to to get that sediment deposit that sediment transport um and you mentioned that, that some are not bes beside rivers i assume there was a the reason why the salt marsh was there in the first place those that aren't currently near rivers had a river flowing to it at some point and that that river got altered is that what the Not understanding necessarily. is necessarily i'm we, we i'm out in our country house in this mm -hmm. summer house and far end of long island eastern long island and we are near an estuary uh, a harbor uh surrounded by salt marshes um that are fed by spring water it's groundwater mm. oh really seeping in that uh, keeps these marshes going. So uh, the neighborhood is called the Springs. And of that's course, why. yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, are those are those salt marshes uh, uh, drastically different from others that are that are uh, I guess um, fed by other types of, of water bodies? I've seen marshes in New Jersey that look pretty much like these. Yeah. Um, not, not, I mean, the ones that I've studied the most in northern New Jersey are the Hackensack Meadowlands, which are different. But I, I've, I've seen marshes that look pretty much like this. You know, when you get um, a, a cove and, uh, you know, an area where there isn't, where you're an estuary and it's not major uh, waves and, and major water movements, a fairly calm place, you're likely to find the salt marsh there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not, there's a river. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's interesting. Um, when we talk about, I mean, it, it, when we, we talked about restoration of these, of these salt marshes, but it's obviously easier and cheaper to protect existing salt marshes. Um, what are what sort of tools or regulations are available to? And I know th this is gonna this is gonna range differently across the world, obviously. But in your area, because we've been focusing on on the New Jersey area, what are the tools that are existing and regulations that are existing that help protect salt marshes, or are there any? Well, in this in the U.S. Coastal marshes come under the Clean Water Act, mm -hmm. and um, Clean Water Act of 1970, or somewhere like that. Yeah, um, it has a section 404 that talks about not filling in salt marshes. This was a response to centuries of people 
seeing a marsh, thinking it was useless, mm. and filling it in and building on it. Right. Uh, I mean, much of um, Manhattan Island, <laughs> right. the lower part of Manhattan Island used to be salt marshes. And, wow. and, and Manhattan Island itself used to be much thinner because you right. had salt marshes now where you've got several streets <laughs> going, <laughs> um, out, extending outward. And, and the airports in the New York area, the Kennedy and LaGuardia and Newark Airport, were all built on marshes. So the um, Section 404 and the Clean Water Act talked about uh, filling in marshes. I mean, that was the major reason that we have, uh, before the sea level rise has become a major issue, that was the major reason that we have lost so much of the original marsh. I wish I had a figure I could tell you a percentage, but mm -hmm. it's over 50. It's a, you know, it's a wow, big that number. much. Wow. Oh, yeah. Because of a few couple centuries of filling them in because people didn't realize that they How were important. They were. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's, it's interesting because I think the same thing happened here in Canada with wetlands um, and salt marshes, even up in, in, in Canada on the East coast. Um, and even I, I remember hearing, I think it was salt marshes in Seattle as well. Um, that was a big problem with filling in salt marshes because they just thought it was just mud and this this field of plants. And it was a bread mosquitoes and it was, you know, yeah, yeah. a place of vermin and whatever. It was more inconvenient than anything else, but they didn't realize the, the, the ecological function there. Right. Happened. So there, there are a number of towns in northern New Jersey um, that were built on what used to be Hackensack Meadowlands, wow. when Hackensack Meadowlands used to be much larger than they currently are. And um, these towns inevitably flood. I mean, yeah. before sea level rise was becoming apparent back in the 60s, you know, and 70s, anytime you had any significant rainfall, these towns were flooding and you'd have pictures in the newspaper People in Wayne are paddling their rowboats down yeah. Main Street, you know, and this was this typical. Yeah, yeah. And they that's built that town, what used to be the marsh. Well, <laughs> there you are. Do you find that now there's still that um, perception that salt marshes are really not worth anything in the, in the sort of the public's eye? Or do they just see their value? I haven't come across people that were that ignorant. Right. I, I, I'm them very well, maybe a whole lot of them. I don't know. Like, does it, it, so now they're protected so they don't get developed over anymore. Is that correct? Well, not totally. What the rules now are, since um, the rules are compensation and mitigation. Right. So that you, it's not you can't, but if you, feel like you have to fill in X acres of marsh, you have to create 3X amount of new marsh or something like that. Right. It's not one for one. It's yeah. you have to create more new marsh than what you take away. But that is also suspect because new, new, newly created or restored marshes are not the equivalent of a natural original salt marsh. I mean, it, it may take them 20 years, to, if ever, to achieve yeah. all the, the functions and all the diversity of a well, natural marsh. Well, and all, yeah, and, and you also think about, I mean, there was a reason why that salt marsh was located in that specific spot. It was obviously ideal to uh, sort of create, you know, naturally a, a salt marsh, where as if they relocate yeah. another marsh, or try and, and, and restore another one, uh, you know, that may be in a poorer area than the one you've destroyed, you know, that takes, that takes into account, right? You, you have to take that into account to say, hey, you know, not all locations are created equal. Absolutely. And right? And I think that's a lot of times that I, f I find that happens when we, when we look at proponents developing or having to remove marshes to, for business purposes, um, not really taking that into account. Not a lot of people. I, I find maybe now they're more taking it, they're taking it into account, but I think it comes with the knowledge of what makes a location ideal to uh, 
put in a salt marsh or put in a coastal habitat that would be that would be suitable and that would be long long lasting yeah i would question the statement they have to remove marsh to make this business true they would want to why can't the business i mean we we've been arguing in new jersey you know why do you have to put it here yeah put it in an urban area that's already developed that needs a little more redevelopment more business and, and you know various cities that are in need of more businesses yeah. and they've already been developed and uh, you know why do you have to uh, destroy marshes to make new businesses i i don't yeah, and and that's okay, no, it, it, yeah. no, it's it's a it's a great question. It, it's and I think it's a question that a lot of people ask when they're when they go through situations like this because, uh, you know, that's where it comes to uh, a lot. It becomes political, right? Where you get a resistance of people saying, "No, let's just keep this natural, like keep this area natural as much as possible." Uh, why do you have to build here? Why can't you build in an area that needs the the revitalization of whatever project you're, you're trying to do? And and um, and I, I feel that doesn't get asked enough or doesn't get addressed enough uh, in the in the sort of the public consultation. And maybe it's because people don't, you know, not a lot of when you, I find when you have these public consultations, not a lot of people know about them, or or sometimes they try and sneak them in. Um, uh, they have and, to have a public hearing, but I guess a whole lot of people are not paying attention. Exactly. Any yeah. kind of notice. They put a notice somewhere in the back of the newspaper saying there's going to be a public hearing. And yeah. most people who aren't tuned in, who aren't heavily involved in it, just don't know. Yeah, for sure. Now, here's something I want to propose to you as we, as we sort of kind of finish up this, this interview. Um, and I find, this, I find this interesting. There was an article I read today. Uh, and I, f- I forget where it is, but I'll, I'll link to it in the show notes. Uh, it was an article that was coming out of Mexico and it was an insurance. I'm not sure if you've read this yet. It's uh, an insurance company, a Swiss insurance company. I think it was called Swiss R E A G uh, is insuring coast uh, coastal coral reefs in uh, the Mayan Riviera area. Oh yeah. Did you I, I hear about that? I heard about it. I didn't read the details. But so, so this yeah. is like the, the details in the article. So it's not complete details, but it's, it's what, what I read. Um, essentially, what, what they're doing is they're getting, they're insuring the coral reefs f- uh, that are along the barrier for the hotels. This is in, in Caz- Cozumel or Cancun. It's in Cancun. Yeah, yeah. it's in Cancun area, the Mayan Riviera area. Right. And what they, on, they're they insuring the coral reefs on the, for the hotels on the basis that the coral reefs provide uh, a protection for the hotels during hurricanes and large storms. And the idea is the, the hotels will pay their, premium, their insurance premiums for that protection. And when a hurricane comes around uh, and... and and destroys a reef or damages a reef, uh, and they never said what level of damage is considered damage, uh, then the, the insurance company will pay out the hotels to rebuild the coral reefs. And the only reason... If, that, only if the reef is, is destroyed by a storm. By but, a storm, that's what they said. most reefs are not being destroyed by storms. They're being destroyed by warming so they're bleaching and dying or they're being destroyed by excess nutrients coming out of the sewage from the hotel causing algae to grow over the coral and kill it you know the amount of coral that's killed by storms i think is well i think that's and and that's the interesting part i was discussing uh with uh, nick weiner from open channels we were discussing this over twitter because he's the one who initially shared it um, and there was a lot of questions we had. And one of those questions was how much coral gets destroyed by a storm during a hurricane? And is this a way for, like, so what you looked at at one point is this is a way for the insurance companies to make money because yeah. like what is considered damage? When do they pay out? Um, but it's also uh, the, in, the, in the article, what they were mentioning is the incentive for uh the hotels to maintain the coral reef habitat. So decrease the amount of discharge from their hotels and the amount of nutrients in their discharge to maintain the coral reef so that when a storm does come, they're in a better situation. They're not as weak or weaker 
than right. they would be if the nutrients weren't there. They can um, can take away their fertilizers from their lawns and blah blah right. blah. Right, and put and in all like their tertiary. neighbors. I mean, it's not just the reef is not going to be just affected by what one hotel does. It would be affected exactly. by the whole general area. Exactly. But then you know you've got <laughs> the issues of um, of warming and bleaching. Yes. And that's, that's, that's a global issue. It's not a local issue at all. Well, my wonder is if you look at that, I agree. I completely agree. It's, it's very difficult to quantify damage based on, on bleaching and then damage based on, um, on storms. Uh, and and it's, you can't really hold the hotels accountable necessarily for maintaining corals that are bleached. Uh, maybe maintaining chlor maybe trying to restore corals or doing something or maybe you know working with the hotels to decrease their impact on on climate change i don't know but it's, uh, you're right it's a very difficult thing to quantify it's a pilot study um but what i what i what i like is it's paying money into a system for the hotels who re who rely on the coral reefs for tourism and protection mm -hmm. um for you know and, and basically they're paying for it they're paying for this protection right and, and so what they also said though is during a, a an emergency like a storm the insurance companies could pay out the hotels faster than the government could because right now the the hotels are actually paying the government a certain amount of money to maintain the corals now of course the hotels don't don't really know where the money's going if it's actually going to maintain the corals and you've got a, a whole slew of problems with climate change and, and all that kind of stuff. What I my question to you is do you think it's a good idea to do the same thing for salt marshes is to have coastal communities pay for the main, maintenance and maybe even restoration of salt marshes for their inevitable protection? Well, I think a lot of communities are paying for restoration projects currently. Oh, really? Like, like through their taxes and whatnot? Yeah. Is I that... think a lot of the restoration projects are, are, are paid by communities. I'm not sure who else would be paying for it. I, I'm not an expert on that. I don't know. Who's footing the bill? Because marsh restoration is really expensive. Who's footing the bill? I think in a lot of cases, it's the town. But yeah. I may be wrong, and it may be only in a, no, a, a small number. I think maybe a lot of the money is coming, you know, from perhaps from the federal government down to the state, down to the community. Yeah. And well, that, that's what I wonder is like if you, if, you know, that's what I wonder is if should like local communities who want to live on the coast, should they be responsible in their, in their taxes to pay a little bit more to maintain their local area? But or you know, it, what, is is maintain, what maintaining it in the face of sea level rise, mm -hmm. maintaining it would involve getting rid of the houses and the roads that are right yeah. behind and the way. Yeah. Um, yeah, that would be an important component. Um, and I'm sure the people paying for that, if they had to pay for that, they wouldn't want to move if they're paying for that as well. Right? Actually, it's interesting. The town of East Hampton, where we are, where I am at the moment, um, has a program uh, wherever they raise extra money from taxes on home buyers of expensive homes and there's a lot of expensive homes not right. in the neighborhood where we are but in the neighborhood fancy fancy people and fancy fancy houses <laughs> yeah. and when 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 there's a, a sale extra money gets put in a fund that has hitherto been used to preserve land hmm. and um now they're allowing it to be used for water projects too but um preserving land involves and and there's two pieces of property that are landward of the marsh and um these are properties that are people i know uh, selling them to the town at somewhat lower than they could get for private so that the town gets them the houses will be torn down and this land will then be open space that's awesome 
and there is making room for the marsh to move back. That's a great idea. Um, and and this works in a, in a fairly well off town where there are expensive houses, and you can put this extra money into this fund to do that. So the town has, you know. I don't know how many millions of dollars that it raises annually. Well, I don't know, raises millions annually, but whatever it is, they can buy properties. And, and usually many of them, it's properties that are like in the woods to keep intact woods and not have houses everywhere, open space that way. But they now are buying some houses, nice houses too. It's sort of, I wish they could, pick them up and move them somewhere else, but they're going to yeah. tear them down. They're going to tear them down. Um, that are adjacent to the marshes. So the marshes will have a place to go. Wow. That's amazing. So yeah. these adaptations, I mean, these, these, I guess these, these are pretty innovative in, in terms of um, what people are doing to allow salt marshes to sort of exist and protect their coastal areas and, uh, and maintain that sort of naturalized area. Um, in the face of, of development. Um, I mean, these are, I guess this would be considered sort of a, a climate change adaptation or would, you well, know, that's, that's what the, the, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's what the, the town is, is aware of the problem and doing something about it with this fund. The fund's been around for maybe 20 years already. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's it's a very conservation minded town right. that wants to keep keep uh, keep staying to be a nice place, you know. Yeah, and one I think it's I think it's a nice great place. idea. Yeah, I think it's a fantastic idea. And, and and the way that works well is because there are quite a lot of a fancy, expensive, multi million dollar properties. Yeah, yeah. If it was just an ordinary town, they probably wouldn't raise anywhere near enough money right with houses that are you know uh, less than a million dollars right or you know a couple hundred thousand a couple of hundred thousand or whatever um th this tax is on the you know the, the the real the fancy estates yeah and there's, there's enough of them here yeah well i mean that's good they're taking that that opportunity to to uh, provide that those funds to 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 adapt, I think that's uh, that's pretty noble of them. I, I yeah, really, well, really the enjoy that. People, you know, there's a lot of good people in this place. <laughs> Absolutely, well, it's great. And I'm sure there are in, in other towns as well that have that are in the same opportunity. I think it would be kind of cool to see their this example, um, you know, reproduced in, in other areas that have that have a similar sort of demographic, a similar like housing demographic, uh, to see that happen. Has this sort of um, procedure or method gotten out into other towns that you know well, of? Well, this the, the five towns on the east end of Long Island all mm. did this, are doing this. So the North Fork and the South Fork and the, um, the, the end of the main part of Long Island, the five towns all agreed to do this. And the two towns that are the wealthiest, mm -hmm. that is East Hampton and South Hampton, um, are being able to do more with it because they have more expensive houses right. than right. the other three towns. So the other three towns have been able to do less. Right, because of the amount of prop because of their property. Or, the amount or, 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 of money, or, 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 the property values, right? Yeah, that's interesting. That's it. Judith, it's, it's, it's always amazing to have you on and talk about <laughs> this kind of stuff. And I mean, it's great to go from like sort of what the importance of salt marshes are uh, to the function, uh, to what's happening and how people are, are adapting to it and, and looking at local, um, you know, local adaptation and, and innovation. I think it's always great to, to see that and not just learn about the theoretical aspects of it as interesting as they are, but to see how people are using it from a, a practical standpoint and a real world standpoint. It's always, um, it's always great uh, to see that. Now your book that you've, that you've written, uh, you co-wrote with, uh, so you, Judith White, uh, 
co-wrote with Carol Butler. Right. Um, this, this book came out in 2009, but I'm sure it's still relevant today. It's called Salt, Salt Marshes, A Natural and Unnatural History. Um, we're going to put this in the show notes so people can, can have access to it. I, I highly recommend uh, this book. Um, to, to be read and yeah absolutely and again uh Drew, thank you very much for for coming on on this show again um uh, you know the first and, and and or the second time and definitely not the last uh we love having you on and we really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your knowledge and, and passion for for coastal the, the coastal hob- habitat we call salt marshes i enjoy talking with you so thank you you bet thanks a lot so that was Judith Weiss, uh, Dr. Judith Weiss, who is a former or a professor emeritus at Rutgers University. She's retired now, still working her butt off uh, to help other people uh, protect the ocean and help uh, contribute to ocean conservation. That's what I love about people like Judith is they just never stop because they are passionate. They have invested their entire life, their heart, their mind, uh, their soul into the ocean, and they continue to do work. She's on the Marine Action team which uh she uh, she's the one who recommended dr Federley, or D- doug Federley to come on when we talked about the uh um uh the marine action team uh that we where we interviewed where they provide support to uh, the sierra club marine action team where they provide support to other groups who are trying to do marine conservation who are trying to protect something that's valuable to them uh where they see that is the, they need help to work with the government the marine action team kind of springs into action like our very own superheroes of um, marine science and conservation field. So uh, Dr. Judith Weiss is a team member from there. I think there's about uh, 10 or more of them, uh, and uh, they do a great job at that. So uh, thank you, Dr. Judith Weiss. Thank you very much, Judith. I appreciate you coming on. And for all you people who are listening, I appreciate you guys. Uh, If you're listening to this uh, and you want to contribute more and you want to talk about it, you've been listening to this podcast, and you'd be like, oh yeah, I want to say something to that or I want to respond to that, go to speakupforblue.com forward slash group. You can uh, let us know what you thought about this episode and all the other episodes and introduce yourself and tell us all about your favorite things, share stories, all that kind of stuff about the ocean in the group. So go to speakupforblue.com forward slash group, use your Facebook account, request to join, and we're in and we're talking. Don't forget also if you want to become a contributor and really become involved, you can do so by going to speakupforblue.com forward slash Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, And we are going to have a great time uh, in that platform as well and building this platform. So thank you very much for listening. I really appreciate it. Have a happy Wednesday. We got Ocean Talk Friday coming up on uh, Friday, coming up in a couple of days. I'll see you then. I am your host, Andrew Lewin. Thank you very much for listening and happy conservation.